Cloud. Okay, we're recording again, and this time it's December 1st. All right, I will try to host. I Maybe my screen is share. We'll find out. I had luck sharing my screen when I use a tab. So I'll try that. Just going to close all my windows. Whiteboard? That's not what I want. What are you trying to share? Uh, my Chrome tab. Hmm, it should work. Well. Although what, what OS are you on? Fedora 35. I've only been able to share whole screens. I haven't been able to share apps. I don't even have the option to share my whole screen. It just says share, let's see what this does, whiteboard. What is, like, can you, you can, I assume you can see me drawing right now? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty Hold useless. Uh, okay, that's not what I want. Okay. I don't want to waste everyone's time here. Uh, if somebody else can share the meeting, I will try to take notes or at least commentate over this. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I guess I'll welcome everyone to the Qbert community meeting. I'm going to be leading it today. My name is David Bossel. Uh, as first off, um, we would like to uh, identify any new members. So if anyone's joining for the first time and wants to say hi, uh, we'd like to meet you and say hi as well. If you haven't already, fill in the attendees uh, at the top of our doc. I'll post it in the chat just so everyone's aware. Um, this document is viewable for and editable by anyone uh, in the Kubevert Bevel Google group. So if you haven't joined that yet, you might have a access denied, but after you join that, you should be able to view it. Um, Here, can you see the notes? I can see your email, which oh, might not right. be what you meant okay. to do. <laughs> Damn it. Don't okay. worry, it's, it's just recorded. Yep. The, um, okay. We can stop the recording and restart if you felt like that was an evasion if you're. Uh, no, given that it was an email about organizing this meeting, it seems OK. OK. Well, the, um, so <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so okay. all of your headers also. Chris, this is what <laughs> happens without you, man. <laughs> Don't worry, Chris. Yes. <laughs> Chris, we're going to be OK. Yeah. <laughs> Notice I'm uh, logged in as a civilian. <laughs> yeah. So for those of you that didn't get the memo, Chris has taken an exciting opportunity, I believe, with NASA. So he's going to, I think he's going to Mars or something. Is that what it was? <laughs> That's what I read. Yeah. Uh, it's way more exciting than leading the uh, Hubert community call. Earth climate science. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Very cool. Yes. Will they be using Qvert? I am going to push hard for it. Um, they're in a big battle between XCAT Cloud and OpenStack, and neither are filling their uh, their hybrid cloud roles. So they don't know what to do. Well, that would be great. We'd be able to have them. OK, as so a... trying again now. Are you getting yes. the notes? I do see it. I'm awesome. clear. OK. OK, so fill in your attendees, uh, fill in the agenda and notes open floor and all that. And I'll give everyone just a, another minute or so to do that. Um, I, had, uh, I just broke off to the edit pack stuff so that I can allow it. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can barely hear you. I think you said you requested edit access. Yes. You should be able to edit if you are part of the Qvert Devel Google group. Uh, so 
maybe double check that you are either on the accounts that you registered or that you have joined that Google group. So it's this Google group. I will Qvert Dev is technically what it's called. I'll put it in the chat. So this looks like a pretty light week. We don't have any agenda or notes. Um, Josh, since you're on the call, are there any updates with the incubation the, that's worth sharing with the community? Yeah, um, the we're down to kind of the last stages of filling out all of the paperwork for the incubation. Um, one of them is um, we've been kind of back and forth with the TOC members on which of our users they consider end users so that we can have them listed under end users as opposed to vendors. Um, the, um, so, and that's been kind of a chronic problem with the CNCF because they keep changing the definition of what's an end user, um, mm. uh, basically from one TOC term to another. So um, once we can actually have another meeting with our sponsor um, we'll get that straightened out, um, and then we should be able to announce it and start collecting votes. Excellent. And do you feel like you have enough support uh, during that upcoming meeting with the sponsor? Yeah. Um, the one thing that we might actually uh, want to do with the community here is if they come back to us, because one of the questions has been, um, uh, you know, in terms of the end users, we might actually come back and they might want a list of some of the commercial end users, that is, people using productized versions of Kubevert um, from various companies, including like Red Hat and Suzy, et cetera. Um, and if they actually want those people, then we might uh, come back to um, folks here and ask for a few names. It seems like they would be interested in somebody who's using productized version of Kubevert if they were also contributing to the community. I, I don't know if we have any of that, but that would be an interesting. Well, but yeah, I mean, I, I this one, yeah, it's honestly, um, less important than the contributing to the community. The whole, the purpose of the end user requirement is honestly just to make sure that the software is useful. Oh um, my goodness. <laughs> the, um, okay. I, I mean, that's really what it is. Um, the, um, just so people, if you've been around open source for a long time, there's been a few organizational mistakes in the world of open source. Um, uh, most notoriously, there was a group called the C++ Object Management Group um, that was comprised entirely of vendors and had no end user requirements. And as a result, they came up with quite a few specifications that were never adopted by anyone. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people who are on the CNCF have been doing this for a long time. And so we're trying to avoid making the same mistakes. I understand better. Yeah now uh, that's really unfortunate uh, the nature mm -hmm. of these two projects like you know c++ specifications yeah. and qvert are very very different <laughs> they they are but organizationally if you're looking at it you know uh, you know new development in open source is still driven by vendors right and um and so uh the cncf and the lf wants to make sure that as things progress towards, hey, this is something that not just um, the contributors, but in fact, the um, Linux Foundation is standing behind, which is, is what happens when we get to graduated level, um, uh, that those things are things that actually have broad adoption. If you follow me? Yes. Um, the... Um, which we know that, which Kubert does, right? We just need to show it on, in a document, so. And, um, yeah, so um, I might come back to the dev list if it turns out that they do want us to list, because we had made the assumption that they did not want us to list um productized kubevert users um but um but based on some things that our uh, sponsors said um they may actually in which case we'll come back and say hey um could you all drop some names in here perfect yeah okay well 
definitely let us know if there's anything we can do to help there. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's the end of, yeah, we have a light week. Let's talk about the, well, first off, does anyone have anything else in the uh, general agenda or open floor before we move on to pull requests? Um, yeah, I wanted to um, introduce um, a new um, Jewish community member um, who's volunteered to try to run this meeting next week. Um, Kat. Hey, Kat. Um, the, um, uh, with Chris getting busy with other things, um, that's, that's, it's both going to be some extra work for some of the rest of us, but, but also an opportunity for other community members to step up. And I'm really happy that, that one of them already has. Um, so meet Kat, um, who has a new project um, based on Kubert um, and who volunteered to try running this particular meeting um, at least next week and, and, and possibly after that. Chris, you won't be replaced, but I'll try to, you know, fill those shoes at least a little bit. <laughs> Well, thank you, Kat. And what's this project? Oh, uh, that it's mostly educational and um, talent pipeline focused um, for people who don't have access to uh, funding for East High, AWS and such. So um, aimed at education institutions and things like that. That container craft. Sounds Early exciting. Days for it still. Okay, so will you plan on taking this meeting uh, next week? Is that what I understand? I will be happy to give it my best. Excellent. Look forward to having you. And I appreciate the help. Thank you. Anything uh, else for the agenda and open floor? All right, so let's take a look at pull requests. Um, and Amar, you have one, uh, four, six, eight, nine, three. I will open it up on my tab. Maybe, um, Josh, you could click on that link too. So everyone has the context of what I'm about to look at. So perform graceful shutdown through ACPI without depending on Burke handler. Okay, currently, uh, signal a sit term for launcher and the following happens for launcher edits its domain metadata right so hi everyone Hey, maybe if you can turn up your volume just a little bit. I can, I can barely hear you. Is it fine now? Yeah, it's better. Okay, great. Um, so basically, I wanted to know that what I'm doing is uh, to the right direction, uh, because um, I've been talking to Vladik and we try to understand why it was uh, implemented this way to, to begin with. Um, so yeah, just would like to hear your thoughts or maybe some history on why it was implemented this way um, and if you think it's the right direction. Yeah, I'm thinking about that. I understand what you've got at. So just to summarize really quickly, what happens today is when Vert Handler, or excuse me, Vert Launcher, which is the pod that the, the virtual machine lives in, rece receives a signal, like sig term. It's going to set a file and it's sort of like directory tree, uh, which then Bert Handler observes to see the graceful shutdowns occurring and Bert Handler is actually calling the uh, ACP shutdown, kind of. It, it's the thing that's trig triggering it rather than Bert Launcher. I'm trying to think if there's any other, I, I need to look at that Bert Handler logic to understand if there's any other uh, knowledge that Bert Handler has that Bert Launcher wouldn't have that influences how the shutdown occurs. 
that would be the thing that I would be looking at here is trying to understand if there's a reason that this logic was split uh, because there's information that only birth handler has. And off the top of my head, I'm not aware of any. Um, so it's okay. unclear why. Well, good to hear that. Um, I think that what Vladik wrote in, in, the, um, in the doc it makes sense that simply because a uh, bird handler uh, needs to treat other, other shutdown uh, situations. Um, so it was implemented this way just because uh, uh, other, other um, graceful related stuff was, were implemented in the handler. Um, okay, so if, if that's the only reason that I guess uh, it is, uh, yeah, it does make sense. Um, okay, just wanted to see if somebody has something interesting to say about it. I'll take a closer look at this. It seems reasonable at first glance, but there might be some devils in the details here. Any other pull requests that we should take a look at? I'll bring one up uh, for myself. I have a feature that I'm working on called virtual machine pools. It's something that we've discussed a lot in the past. And um, what we have seen, well, the evolution of Qvert was that we started uh, looking at virtual machines as pods uh, and uh, looking at the VMI as being kind of an ephemeral uh, virtual machine, uh, similar to a pod, which is ephemeral. And um, over time, we split the VMI into a VM and the VMI. So the VM is the stateful thing. The VMI is the ephemeral one-shot thing, similar to the pod. So the VM uh, represents a stateful virtual machine. Uh, in the early days of Qvert, we created a VMI replica set, which allows us to scale out replicas of the ephemeral virtual machines, the VMI. Um, but we haven't had a great solution for scaling out the stateful virtual machines, which is really what people are probably more, more more familiar with coming from like AWS or GCP or something like that. Um, so the virtual machine pool essentially works uh, like that. It's going to allow us to scale out uh, stateful virtual machines and uh, create update um, strategies and things like that for kind of a, a pool of virtual machines uh, that we want to treat um, a little bit differently than you would uh, for example pods in deployment or pods in a replica set or VMIs in a virtual machine replica set. So that's coming down the line. I, I think that that will be uh, hopefully adopted. Uh, I know that we have had some community members ask for this type of behavior in the past. So that's coming down the pipeline. All right, we can spend a few minutes looking at bugs. No, nope. let's take a look at the mailing list first. Again, I can't share my screen, which is unfortunate. Maybe if uh, whoever's sharing their screen could click on the mailing list link there. Let's take a look. What was the date of our last meeting? It was the 24th. So starting around the 24th, um, If VM running does not have a guest agent connected, let's see if this has gotten good feedback. I'm reading through this. So there's no commentary at the moment. Did my reply make sense? He's uh, basically running the virtual machine within the VMware environment, VMware vSphere. 
and that virtual machine doesn't have guest tools installed? I guess I don't completely understand what's being asked here. So the, um, whoever's sending this is trying to understand why they can't connect to the guest agent. Uh, so the community guest agent probably is not present in their virtual machine. Is that exactly. Right. Uh, So it sounds like they just need the QMU guest agent installed. I think uh, the user had multiple things going on. Um, he was wondering why he, he, it seemed at first he couldn't start the virtual machine um, because his his uh, host was a virtual machine itself. And so he would have had to uh, enable nested emulation. I see. Wow, this is, uh, this is a complicated one. Yeah, it was nested emulation. He had a networking issue. Um, then he had guest tools issue. OK, it looks like they're getting closer. They're at least yeah. getting some help yeah. there. So moving on to the next one, vhost support in QVert. Uh, this, is a, this is an old one. Okay, so we have interest in vhost support in QVert. We already had a pull request. It's almost, it's probably over a year old. It sounds like they're trying to resurrect that. And Petter has responded. It sounds like that one's gotten attention. Um, call for papers for Fosdom. All right, so if you are interested in contributing a talk, Fosdom 2022, uh, it looks like it's gonna be hosted virtually on February 5th. Yeah, and um, the, oh, it's the, yeah, okay, it's gonna be virtual. So the, um, we don't have to try to find travel money for people. The, um, uh, if if you do get a talk accepted, I'll happily send you a t-shirt. Um, the, um, uh, but yeah, this is a good audience for this because it's a virtualization, um, uh, dev room, and they already explicitly include Kubrit in that, um, which not all virtualization events do. Um, so it would be nice to have a couple of talks in there. Um, FOSDEM happens on European time, though, um, so so be aware if you're in the U.S. that, that your virtual talk might get scheduled at 4 in the morning. Um, the... Um, uh, I don't know how attendance at virtual FOSDEM has been um, the compared to the real life event, uh, compared to the in-person event, that is. Um, but on the other hand, you don't have to travel anywhere. Um, it's the right audience to hear about Kubert. Um, and um, <clears throat> if you're, if for people unfamiliar with FOSDEM, um, they tend to lean towards the new tech, experimental, et cetera. So it's a better audience for talking about new features, next release of Kubert, um, you know, weird use cases um, than necessarily just what is Kubert. Excellent, excellent. And have we presented at Austin before at Kubert Talk? I don't know. Uh, is Fabian on the call? 
I guess not. Nope. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah. The um, um, given the inclusion of Kubert in the list of technologies, I suspect that we have. Um, for uh, the Red Hat contingent here, Fosdom is one of the events that's officially sponsored by Red Hat. So um, for hatters that have wanted to attend in person, it's pretty much automatically approved. Um, so I am I work for anybody who doesn't know me, I work for Red Hat's open source practice office. Um, so it has not involved me if somebody has gone. Um, I the, um, but I, I suspect that we have. Um, given given that why else would we be listed in their list of technologies? Certainly. Yeah, and this is a great opportunity for anyone who wants to, to get involved mm -hmm. with presentations yeah. and stuff like that. It gives you a lot of exposure as well. Yeah, so and and speaking for the for OSPO, I'll, I'll post this in the notes, but speaking for the OSPO, if somebody wants to do this and it's their first time submitting a talk or whatever, um, I'm going to post a link to a forum. We have a team um, of people who uh, work with open source conferences and we will happily review your talk pitch in order to help you improve it. So I'll put a link in the uh, in the minutes for that. Excellent. And the last mailing list post is about extending cloud and that's, this is something I'm giving attention to right now. So Ryan from NVIDIA wants to add some information to cloud and uh, about the instance type, which would um, be the name of the flavor. So we have this new flavor API for virtual machines and we would be passing in uh, the flavors name as uh, cloud net metadata. So it would tell us uh, if you're running a virtual machine, you would have some information, cloud net metadata about what flavor was used to start your, your guest. So it would say, this is a C4 large or whatever. So my names are flavor. Um, it makes sense, I think. So it's the thing I'm working with Ryan on, Ryan on, uh, on the PR. I think that's it for the mailing list. Let's take a look. What is next in our agenda? I think we are going to do a brief bug scrub. All right. Uh, so I will look through this link. So VMs cannot reboot when emulation is used. That seems to be a problem. For some context here, emulation mode is not something that we seem to test very well. Uh, so we have seen problems with this in the past. So when use emulation is set to true, um, VMs are able to soft reboot. So that means rebooting within in the same pod. Petter, are you on the call right now? No, I don't see him. It's unclear if this occurs without emulation mode. I want to double check that. I think it's only when, when emulation is enabled. That's my, that's my expectation when I'm reading this. And the soft reboot, how is it occurring here? I think it, they just do a, we just do a, a just a reset or reboot. I see. But the point was, is I think the point is that uh, 
the memory, it keeps consuming memory. And he found, I think he found out that uh, if you try to, if you try to start another one in parallel, then it will just block the boot. So it's like something with memory, I think. It's a, that's the, at least it's a, that's really what they suspect. So yes. we're saying yeah. that uh, rebooting the gas internally, the QMU process begins to consume twice the memory resources from the pre, so it's it's not freeing or reusing the memory resources from the previous. That's, uh, I'm not sure I completely understand. I have an idea. Okay. I don't know. I know it, it happens on a conformance test that one of the uh, one of the users they want to to pass it. Ah, and they run it on, uh, I think they run it on AWS, but it's not, I don't think it's, uh, it matters because he said it, it was able to reproduce. Marta's triage accepted. Somebody should take a look at it. It should technically work. If it doesn't, it might be a cumulative bug uh, if the resources aren't being used efficiently, but we need to know if it's us. All right, next one. How to attach UDME device plug in PCI multi-root switch to the virtual machine? Wow, that's a very specific <laughs> question. Okay, looks like this one's already been addressed. We have documentation. Yeah, but in general, we are not going to support um, uh, multiple devices uh, in the same in the same IMMU group. We're just going to support one uh, that's one one map to, to another, one MMU group to to a device. Yeah, Vladik, I just referenced the documentation is written there. So if it's a requirement, I think he's going to to reply to the issue. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. Is there a reason, technically, why somebody would need to do this? Uh, I, mean, so I guess that's what we're asking. I guess it depends on the hardware layout. Um, yeah. So it um, depends how um, the PCIe slots are uh, kind of arranged on the hardware. Um, so sometimes you can plug uh, something into a, into a bridge, um, some kind of a device into a bridge, and then uh, that bridge will be represented in like all of the devices in that bridge will be represented under one IMMU group. And then if you pass that uh, all of these devices together to a virtual machine, then they will all have uh, access to their to their own like, to the memory of each other. Hmm. And uh, yeah, kind of problematic. Okay, sounds like that's getting attention. All right. So next one, is there any way to allow VM to acquire IP address from real DHCP server, not the Kubernetes network? Yeah, we'll just use a grid, right? 
Yeah. Sure. Oh, sorry. That one looked like just an information request, so I skipped it. Okay. Yep. But this is a bug reported by Roman. Yeah, this one is strange. Let's see. Great. All right. So it looks like with Fedora 35, the IP address is no longer working. Uh, excuse me, the IP address is no longer being reported via the guest agent in the way that we expect. So we are setting it on the VMI. Hmm. That is not great. Noticed a few things have changed with Fedora 35. We had some problems SSHing uh, using our Golang cube control SSH to Fedora 35 as well. All right, triage accepted. Uh, this would be a great bug for somebody to take a look at. Is anyone interested in looking at this? What is the, it's, the guest is not reporting the IP addresses? So what is happening, just top level glance at this, is that with Fedora 35, when the guest agent is installed, we are not getting the um, IP address reported back as we expect. So we have this logic that uses the guest agent um, Request some information from the guest agent, and that, that gets reported back to Vert Handler, which then fills that IP address information in onto the VMI spec uh, in the status section. Sorry, not the spec, the status section. So that's uh, being left blank, probably because we know that we've connected to the guest agent. We know we've requested this information, and we didn't get anything uh, usable in response. So either the um, data structure that's been reported back from the community gas station has changed or um, something else has occurred where we don't get that IP address from the agent anymore. So, so now we are now working on on something very odd there that happens and uh, and we have another bug about it like if someone changes the MAC address inside the guest so, and it caused a lot of mess, but uh, so you can assign it to me. It's ed dev, I think. Done. And then I'll I'll check what to do. Maybe to pass it to the person who fixed the current PR. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that's gonna. I mean, Fedora is kind of our um, canary here. When things happen in the latest Fedora that are are odd. Um, it's just a matter of time before that trickles out to a larger, larger audience. So it's great for us to get ahead. And we also, by the way, we, it's a good opportunity to update that based on the problem that we saw when changing the changing stuff inside the guest. Like if the user of the guest is changing the MAC address of the virtual nick there, it will mess up all our logic uh, pretty badly. And um, so we asked uh, the guest agent developer, I think it's the under chemo project. We asked them to to help us and report back not the not the soft soft Mac by the hardware Mac and maybe even the PCI addresses. So we'll be able to to have a better matching capability here. Uh, we will see. There are at least two or three bugs. I think it's two are supposed to be open. About this. Okay. All right. Signed to you. Thanks for looking into that. Uh, the last one, uh, I guess, just going a week back, is for control SSH the Fedora 35 guest is not working. But we've um, we've kind of figured it out. We know why at least that's occurring, and there's some workarounds. And then we have fixes incoming from. 
Golang itself and the crypto libraries to make this work moving forward. Uh, so that's it for the bug scrub. I think that's it for the meeting. Let's take a look. Yeah, that's that was our last item. Um, hey, David, yeah. I, I wanted to, hey, it's Ryan. I wanted to um, bring one other thing up. If this is, uh, so if you, I think a few meetings ago, I brought up the, um, the issue 6756, which is the, the res control QoS performance sensitive workloads issue. Um, I wrote a comment in there for Thanksgiving, uh, but I, um, I wanted to just bring it up. Um, and Can you post the, uh, I, you said yeah. a number and that five, number. Six, seven, five, six. Yeah, you got it. Hold on, let me put it in there. <laughs> Maybe put it in the open floor or something. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, so the um, we there's been some discussion on this, and you know, I've talked to Vladek and others. Um, I so I just wrote some kind of um, ideas that I had in mind for how this could look, and I just want to get some thoughts on on you know maybe you know what we'll if this makes sense to people or maybe it's the right direction or whatever. Um, you know, based on you know, people people think of the options. Vladek, I know yeah. you've been pretty close to this. Uh, did you have any, did you see Ryan's latest comment five days ago? Yeah, sorry. Um, actually, no, but uh, I just, just didn't get to it. I'm sorry, I, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. Can you summarize quickly, Ryan, uh, what yeah. this was? I, I looked at it last week, Thanksgiving happened, and um, my mind does not remember. Is I, I um so basically we're we're where we were on this is like that um there there really isn't a way like Kubernetes doesn't support um the ability to to control the L3 cache on on um, on like a Numa node. We don't have like the ability to like control it at the pod level. Um and this this work, you know, like we need to do it in CPU manager and um I mean, probably a lot of other things that we need to go into this. And so a lot, a lot, a lot of things would need to happen. Um, so specifically this issue was um, trying to find a way um, to enable this and, and not necessarily like, can, it could be to, to solve it in some way, but but I, I ultimately I expect Kubernetes to be the, the real vehicle, but to at least enable it in some way. And so I, um, because I ultimately like there could be custom solutions that, that could look at or uh, that are out there that instead of um, using like CPU manager or, or whatever to solve this. So so I, I made three suggestions in terms of ways to solve this. And um, so primarily focused on like enabling, sort of exposing those res control groups um, to through the Kubernetes, through the Kubernetes API. So the one of them, the simplest one, the first one is that um, is to make the launcher privileged and basically we could mount the rest control pseudo file system into the vert launcher and then let's, you know, vert launcher do all the work and um, set all the parameters. Uh, this would probably be needed behind a flag considering that it's, we need to change the privilege model for, for vert launcher. That's one. Um, the second one um, was uh, we could Add some tunables into the, the VMI's spec, uh, the virtual machine API. Um, Vert handler um, could let the CPU manager um, handle, you know, all the work it does now, assigning the CPUs to the pod. And then we could look at the tunables that were set on the on the VMI, and then apply some rest control settings. So that would need to be Vert handler would need to do some accessing the host and do some work to set that up. And then the third option was that we have some tunables on the VMI on the virtual machine. Um, and then we assume that either CPU manager or some other solution handles everything. Um, and we just, all we do is we just take the, the, the tunables and just bring, propagate them all the way down to the, um, to the domain. Um, on the on the uh, for the guest on the in the vert launcher. So those are the three options I was thinking of. What are, what do people what are reactions to that? I think 
I would like to expose an escape hatch for you to allow you all to make this work in a way that doesn't require you to immediately making changes to CPU manager or uh, involve tunables on the VMI spec. So if we, if we created a feature gate that allowed privileged vert launcher pods and you had a, uh, a hook, like a pre-start hook, would that technically allow you to express the configuration that you're looking for? Yeah, that should. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't, don't want to speak for, for Ryan, but yeah, that should. I think that's the fastest path for you, Ryan. This is a really complex topic um, because it involves you know multiple projects, and uh, we've seen that it's really difficult to have these conversations take, they don't take weeks, they don't take months, they actually take years to, to really yeah. invoke change. Uh, we've seen the same thing with like topology manager and schedule, um, with new malware scheduling and things like that. Uh, making, making changes in these areas are things that um, takes quite a bit of time. I think that it's useful to try to go ahead and make progress yourself and then uh, use that as part of the discussion to make permanent change within the ecosystem. Um, so all that said, I think that we would be in favor of enabling whatever you need to make this work um, as optional feature gates and uh, hooks for your own like third party code. Right. So it sounds like, so option one, which was, so make it privileged and then, and then hooks. And so there's, so is it, um, and from your perspective, would you say that like, um, is it option one, you know, the most favorable in terms of like, well, like from your perspective that because um, it, it's like, we're not changing the API, like we're not, you know, we're not looking at um, it's like favorable. the least amount of changes. It's favorable because it's achievable. Uh, all the other ones don't look achievable in the near or medium term. It's something that we can start discussions about with the because it involves CPU manager and other other things are outside of our control today. So well, essentially so, we yeah. Yeah, like so if two sorry from two and three, my my expectation is that with two and three we would not need to rely on a feature in CPU manager. We would just assume its behavior is exactly the way it is today. But we would be we would be applying the res control settings ourselves. Yeah, I feel like that's and a handler. Yes, it's uh, it's it, it is. Yeah, it is. So that option two involves enabling something that isn't necessarily Kubert's responsibility. But it's I'm concerned so, that option two, while it's technically totally possible, uh, it's not something that we can maintain long term. So that's my hesitance with option two. Okay. Okay. Option three is is to essentially assume that it's already done, like the CPU manager already handles it, and it's just to expose the API as if it already exists. So it's it like, it'd just be like, it'd be like having a hook just at the, at the higher level, at the highest level. How, how does it help you though? So the, like we, we don't use CP manager. That's that's why. Like we would just we would just develop this outside of it. Oh, so you okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you would see the tunable and then essentially uh, exactly. do your own custom logic. Okay. Yeah, like uh, for, with three, like my perspective is that like I, it's a use case, and I think that it's a use case that will eventually happen. And so I I wanted to like I'm it, and we're interested in enabling it. So I just wanted to while we're going to do the work, I want to make sure that. Cuber can benefit from as much as we want to, you know, as much as we can, you know, that we want to, you know, with this feature. And 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 again, like, Mike's, we, we we're going to use this, and so we would maintain whatever this, even with two and three, like it, this is something that we would fully want to maintain. Okay, well, so with three, uh, I don't have a problem with three if we're just saying an annotation in the VMI, and you have a node level daemon set that's interpreting that. Um, that I mean, that's that doesn't matter to me. From a maintenance perspective of Qvert, I don't care at all. That's totally fine. 
just, my, my just one is, point. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm just uh, trying to understand. Even if you will have <laughs> um, annotation or anything like this, I mean, will Libre be able to set this? Uh, this is my understanding, essentially, right? You, you just want to send this, uh, to propagate these uh, configurations to Libre and then let Libre it and to set this. Is that uh, what you're... From the Qvert side, yes. That's, that's all Qvert would do on option but Can Libre do it uh, from within <clears throat> the unprivileged container? Um, well, so the, well, so we would like, well, so I, I guess, so here's my expectation is that like, we would do, we would do everything like in terms of rest control, it would already be done for the pod. The only thing that we would do is, is we would take the, um, any of the, the expectations and expose it to deliver it. So it's actually no different than, than option one. It's just, we're not, we don't need to do anything on the host. That's, it sounds to me like uh, option three is just taking the, I might be totally wrong about this, taking the privileged stuff out of the Brit Launcher pod, putting it somewhere else yeah. where things happen. And then option three just involves setting the Libvert bits. So you, really option one and three are kind of the same. You can use a hook for the Libvert part. So you can get your custom Libvert logic and you can send annotation to VMI perhaps to, to do the special privileged um, res control stuff externally then. Yeah, the, yeah, they're similar. I mean, the only, I guess the difference is this three, like I don't expect for launcher have to be privileged because we're not going to be doing anything with res control. We would just, it would already be done for us on the pod. We'd assume it's there. We just, we're going to pass any of the information to live like, you know, whatever the cache settings are and they should already be assigned to the pod. We're just letting the guests know about them. I'm just not sure. And then you will pass it to Libert? Yeah, to Libert and right. right. But Libert will, okay. <laughs> so it's, that's my question. Uh, Libert will run invert launcher that doesn't have any privileges. Uh, even though you've set up something uh, on the um, on the pod, um, Libert will still need to execute um, the rest control uh, operations. Will he be allowed? Will Libert be allowed to do that? So that was okay. Maybe I had the wrong expectation, the wrong assumption here. Because like, wh why would Liver if if it was already done for Liver? So Liver's assuming then that it, it when it you execute when you provide this to the domain, um, like to the DOM XML, that it's going to have to do all the rest control work itself. This is what Liver does, yeah. Okay, so then you will always need. Then you will always need privileged in the, the ver launcher even if even if this was enabled in cpu manager then i guess this is not really 100 percent related to cpu manager the only thing is that uh, related to cpu manager is that knowledge uh, on which cpus do you need to configure that option but um if you take this out of the equation then then and you know on which cpus do you need to do it um, then um, you just tell Libert where do you want that, and it will be done. But it, it will you need to interact with the rest controllers. That's why I'm, I understand that. Okay, so then one and three are the same then. That that's it's because it needs to be because we have to have privilege. Then if, if Libert needs to do work with the rest control, yeah. I mean it has to be mounted then. Anyway. This okay. is what I understand. Yeah. So th that's why <clears throat> what David suggests is uh, I think it's the best uh, way forward. Um, just to enable, to have some kind of control, uh, to enable privileged uh, libert, and then um, uh, and then either a hook or uh, uh, annotation to enable that. Okay. Okay. I would suggest just doing a rapid prototype of whatever it takes to get this to work for you, and then gaining understanding of this end to end. Maybe maybe you've already done that. Um, understanding end to end of what it takes to get this work without uh, changing a lot of QVERT or anything else. And then we can uh, fill in any gaps. So the gap will probably be that you need us to enable privilege mode like a, as a feature gate. We can certainly talk about that. If there's anything else that involves actually modifying the Libvert domain XML, uh, I think we would prefer that to be in a, a hook, like a sidecar hook of some sort. Yeah. Um, but that's something we can look at as well. But that, that seems less likely. 
will be able to, to help much there. Do you feel like you have a, at least a path forward now that makes sense? Yeah, okay. So I, I think um, like the most appealing at least, the, so I've, I've done a little bit of work on this and that's what led me to one, but let me try, let me do this again with, um, um, just to make sure that like I, like my assumptions are correct here. Are, are, yeah, just to make sure that, cause I, I think one in, yeah, I think I have a path forward to answer your question. I think I have a path forward in terms of like, if we can do a flag that to make this like to, to enable this, like if I can contribute something like, you know, to enable it that way, I think that would, that's kind of what I'm looking for. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds great. I think okay. we are yeah, thanks, at the top of the hour here. Uh, unless there's anything else, I think we'd close out the meeting. All right. Enjoy your week. We'll catch up next week. Bye. Thanks. Bye.